Hey folks, so I've been getting a lot of questions about uh, a variety of things since um, one of my videos and some of the things with what do you do, how do you prepare uh, to move abroad, how do you get a job, those type of things and I didn't feel like the authority in that because I am winging this. I don't know what I'm doing and I felt like there would probably be some benefit of hearing the stories of other people who have moved abroad. So that's what I did. In this series you'll see a variety of different people who took the leap and they moved abroad and you hopefully can get some type of perspective or can identify with someone's stories if you can't necessarily identify with mine and I hope it's helpful I hope that it's as inspirational for you as it was for me just hearing their stories and I hope you can get some insight and some inspiration so let's get into the first interview I started off with um, my friends from Lisbon and then I went the gamut of various people that I've met online over the last COVID uh, weeks and interviewed them during this pandemic. So I will continue to share my vlogs with you in regards to my actual life in Lisbon. But I did, you know, during this time where outside isn't necessarily open per se, I wanted to take the time to introduce you to some phenomenal people that made the leap in various countries, not just Portugal, and see if you will have some fun meeting them as well. Thanks. Hey folks, I want to thank you again so much for joining me. Today I'm here with some of my first friends I met in Lisbon and we have Chris and Jamila. Thanks for joining us guys. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for having me as well. <laughs> so if we can start ladies first, Jamila, tell us where are you from? Um, so I am from Harlem, New York. I was uh, actually born in Montreal, Canada, but I spent most of my life um, in New York. So I, I call myself a New Yorker. <laughs> now, Chris, where are you from? I'm from Sweden and namely the, the city of Malmö in the south. Just briefly, I want to talk about this whole digital nomad life and the ambiguity of what that means and what that entails. And so many people are interested in being either in, uh, location independent or working online, but they don't know where to begin. So Chris, where would you um, kind of advise people who wanted either more education or wanted to know where to start? Uh, I would start by actually evaluating myself a little bit, like, because there's many people saying, how can I be a digital nomad? And that's basically asking how long is this rope, you know, because the, the thing is that it's very hard if you don't actually know who the, what this person can do and who this person is. So I would basically start just writing three lists for myself. First of all, what am I good at? And that could be anything like it could be um, car mechanics. It could be um, restoring houses. It could be selling vacuum cleaners, whatever. Just actually list all these things down that you feel that you're good at. It can be soft skills and hard skills. And I would say also, what can I do professionally? What is my uh, work life experience and um, what have I learned so far in my career? And then I would say, what do I want to do? And in this case, especially focus on like digital tools, things that I can do remotely. Mm -hmm. And that is quite easy to figure out. And when you have that, basically you can draw lines between what you can do, what you're good at and uh, what you want to do. And so the thing is, what, what people forget, they seem to forget sometimes is that your experience and your competence within a field can be very good if you just transform it to a digital a skill. Mm -hmm. um, we, we always talk about in, in, in our um, Swedish online community, we always talk about one example and that for example is car mechanics, um, that if you're a car mechanic, you can't actually do that remotely because I mean, maybe it will be possible in the future, but today it's very hard to do that. Um, but you know a lot of things about a car. So you're good at um, car mechanics, you're, you're good at the mechanic part, you're actually good at knowing a lot of things about how a car is built up and so on. So what you need to do is that you just draw these lines until what you want to do in the digital sector. And that could be, for example, writing articles about cars. It could be writing SEO text about cars because you know that area very well. The only thing you need to do is to learn one of these skills. And when you have what you need to learn, then basically Google is the source. I mean, you, you can just search for SEO tutorials or like SEO beginner's guides or whatever. You have LinkedIn, you have YouTube, you have Khan Academy, you have also different kind of Facebook forums and networks uh, and skill sharing services and so on. Like the, the web is the biggest library we have. So as long as you just know what you need to search for, 
just start searching. That's great, Net Tips. How about you, Jamila? Um, yeah, I think everything Chris said is on target. I think that inventory of understanding, you know, what it is that you're good at, what it is you're interested in, and what it is that you want to do for work and trying to connect those dots really help. And I think you have to think a little bit outside of the box as far as what you've typically done for work and how a lot of the skills that we have that we've used in a physical setting just right now in these times by default are, are happening remotely. So it almost feels like it's the prime time for people to position themselves to be remote workers as we go through this whole virus where we're in a place where people can't go to the office. So a lot of work that was viewed by companies as work that could not be done remotely will turn into positions that I think will go remote. And I do think specifically for me, thinking about just professional services, if there are things that you already do, how can you start offering those digitally online? And there are so many other services that can be offered to businesses, specifically businesses that operate online. So educating yourself on what those services are that they need. And as Chris said, there is just so many resources online where you can take courses, you can join groups, you can do mastermind courses. It's all about just getting yourself involved in the different activities to figure out what your sweet spot is. I know for me, I had to, I, I decided to leverage some of my previous professional career, but for a lot of people who are making this transition, they may want to do something completely different. So this is really mm -hmm. the time to just get curious about what it is that you enjoy. How do you want to spend your time and how can you structure that in a way where you can do it online? And I think, you know, the world is becoming a lot more accepting of online digital work. So I think it's just a matter of time before a lot of us are going to be positioned this way. So now it's the time. <laughs> no, I, I agree totally. And I think what people need to understand, especially as it's moving abroad, you may not need as many clients to secure if you're living in a country where the expenses are lower. So you kind of want to consider that. I, I know in the States, we, we kind of chase money because that's kind of how it's worked out. But if you move out of the country, you don't need um, as much money. And if you're just starting off, you may not have that pressure of needing 16 clients. You may just need three in order to cover your expenses. But I would say ultimately, um, to start to network and start to talk to people. And there's, to me, there's certain skills you should just work on. And one of them is writing. And yeah. if, it's, if, it's, if you're not good at writing, you should be able to be good at storytelling, whether you're doing that in you know, video or a podcast or, or whatever. But those types of skills and businesses need that. Businesses will always want more customers. And if you can find a way based on an industry or based on a niche to help a business or help anyone get what they ultimately want, then you'll always have a job regardless of what the economy is doing. And I encourage people who are listening to this, who are interested in kind of being location independent or do, being in a digital nomad is just understand that in a world where every, where things tend to be pretty self-absorbed, <laughs> if you focus on helping other people get their common goal, you will always have some work aligned up for you. So I hope that's helpful. I feel like that you have to go through the process and take a deep dive. Yeah, I, I got this question so many times. And it's, it's a little bit like, I mean, th that people think that digital nomad is a profession in itself, you know? That right. How can I become a digital nomad? That's not, <laughs> that's not what you become. Like, I mean, that's a lifestyle. Right. That's something you a don't live. A lifestyle, exactly. Yeah. But then you need to have a work. You need to have a job. You need to have different kind of gigs. And I mean, I would say that the, my best recommendation is to have a broad network doing that because when mm -hmm. you have trust and you have this uh, um, basically agreement between people, then it doesn't matter if you're remotely or not, exactly. because trust that person. And that is usually the, the hardest barrier when it comes to giving someone remote work is that you don't trust they will do it when you don't see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, as long as you have a good network, then you can, work from wherever and you can create that network back in the US where you already have a network. So. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. I think it's important that people know, like build your network before you leave. Like you don't have to just get up and leave and then figure out how you're going to become Ex a exactly. nomad. Be a digital nomad where you are right now. Like make your apartment, <laughs> yeah. your destination and figure it yeah. out. <laughs> That's so, a good point. It's, it, it's not drive. as hard as people make it. Yeah, I agree. I agree.
Awesome. And Jamila, is this your first time living abroad? And if not, where were you prior? Um, this, well, this is part of my first time living abroad. Before I arrived in Thailand with my partner, well, before I arrived in Portugal with my partner, we were in Thailand for about seven months. Um, we were based in Bangkok and we did some traveling throughout Southeast Asia. So this is technically an extension of my first time living abroad because we've chosen to come here to Portugal now. And what made you choose to come to Portugal after living in Thailand? Um, well, when we decided to leave New York, the idea was for us to go to two different destinations. My partner had spent time in Thailand about 13 years ago, and I had come to Portugal about two years ago on a solo trip, and I really fell in love with Lisbon and Porto and just felt some sort of magnetic energy. So I felt very strongly about us coming back here. So how about you, Chris? What brought you to Lisbon? Um, a lot of things. Um, I would say I always wanted to live abroad, just to first to say that. And second of that is basically I always wanted to live in Southern Europe. So for me, I just needed to explore a couple of places down there, and which I did. I just took my, my bag and my computer and traveled around a little bit around these countries. And um, I actually got convinced by a lot of things in Lisbon. And uh, I think we'll get into it a little bit further into this interview, but there's a couple of um, bullets on my checklist that I always check when I like looking for a place to stay. And this, this list is becoming more and more how to say advanced and, and complex mm -hmm. because my requirements is always increasing. Okay, so when it was time, and I'll point this question to Jamila first, when it was time to figure out um, where you wanted to move abroad when you and your husband were thinking about it, what were the things that you considered? Um, I think the things that we considered, um, namely one of the, the biggest things for us at the time we were leaving was cost of living because we were both transitioning out of our jobs that we had back in New York. So that was pretty high up on the list for us as well as quality of life. We told ourselves we wanted to always have nice weather. So we were trying to somewhat escape the winter. And um, we wanted to try two different destinations, specifically um, Southeast Asia, as I said, my partner spent some time there, so he really fell in love with the culture and the people, and he had some connections there. And I felt as though Lisbon was a good location as far as being in the south of Europe. Um, my sister lives in London, and I also have really been interested in being able to just be in Europe and explore, and Lisbon just felt like a really good home base to kind of give us the ability to see more. So when you said that you were leaving, both of you and your husband were leaving your New York jobs, how did you research um, how to find income in Thailand or in Lisbon? Well, I think what we both did was we, we kind of set ourselves up to be able to be uh, location independent with the work that we were transitioning into. So I work as a consultant and my husband teaches English. So what we did was we just kind of took a, a, a good solid, I'd say, you know, six months to be able to structure ourselves where we understood the, you know, how we needed to have our business set up, how we needed to be able to get leads, to be able to have clients. And it just really kind of took feeling as if we had a good base before we left because kind of trying to restructure your career is something that you can do while you're on the move, but it's good to at least understand the basics and be able to be earning a minimum level of income to feel comfortable kind of moving away from your home base. Absolutely. And Chris, when you decided to do your research as to where you were going to move abroad, how did you start about going about doing that? Um, I usually start uh, in terms of weather, actually, um, coming from the north, you know, <laughs> I really want to escape the, the cold six month winter of, uh, of the Nordics. So first of all, I'm looking into the weather and in Portugal, you have good weather all year round, basically. Um, and the sun is, is basically always present. Um, but other than that, I also thinking about the same uh, kind of perspective as Jamila, like looking at cost versus quality, what can I get for my money there? Um, because I mean, money is important, but it's definitely not everything for me. So um, I rather just want to uh, sort of get as much as get, get as much life quality as possible for the money I earn and the money I'm ready to pay for, for my stay there. Uh, but when it comes to, to Lisbon in general, like what I really what really got my uh, attention and my love is the culture and the people in, in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. And I would say in Portugal in general, because 
the hospitality and the warmth that I feel in, in Lisbon and Portugal is something that I would say is extraordinary. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of places in the world where I felt the same, but having it in, in Europe and especially having it in South of Europe is um, pure luxury for me because then I also have um, not that much of a distance to go actually back home. It's almost four hours flight. So uh, that is also important for me to be, to be close to, um, to my home, but still live abroad. Mm-hmm. But um, also I want to add another thing that I think is uh, a rising perspective and a rising um, reason for, for people moving to, to Lisbon, and that is the, the professional network. First of all, uh, there's many people uh, like me, uh, so-called digital nomads, basing themselves in Lisbon because of the reasons that I already said, but also because of the, the increasing community um, of especially professionals when it comes to tech and IT and marketing and so on. So it's, it's a good place to be in order to live your entrepreneurial dream and uh, to broaden your network when it comes to your career. Yeah, I agree. I definitely, I definitely agree with that, Chris. And one more thing I wanted to add was another reason I chose Lisbon um, is because I felt very safe and secure here. Like Chris said, the people, the culture, and just how you feel accepted. And I remember when I traveled here, solo. It wasn't my first time traveling to Europe on my own. And I remember just feeling so safe and secure and welcome. And um, that was a really good feeling to have because there's some places I've been to where I haven't really had that feeling. And I think that's what made it so much easier to just pick up and and go. So, yeah. And so we have uh, two different perspectives. Of course, Jamila, you are a U.S. citizen that um, decided to come to Portugal. So what did you have to do to stay in Portugal for an extended period of time? So we are actually still in the process of going through the extended period of time um, in regards to our stay here. But initially what we did was we came here on a three month Schengen tourist visa. So that enabled us to be here for three months. We were able to have that visa extended. Unfortunately, due to the circumstances, our plan was to travel home and apply for a long-term visa, but instead, we are now going the route of applying for um, a manifestation of interest so we can apply from here in the country and not travel back home. I would say one thing I've experienced as difficult as this process has been, people have been super understanding, super flexible. Even right now during COVID times, the government has extended our visas through the 30th of October. So it gives us ample oh, wow. time to plan and yeah. make sure that we can figure out how we can stay here. So even though things are a little bit uncertain, it does feel like the process is manageable. Um, my advice would be do as much research as you can. If you are coming from the United States, my suggestion would be to apply for a visa before you come, especially if you know you want to stay. But if you end up like me, you can come and you can figure it out. Uh, so there are ways, but you know, the more research you do ahead of time and understanding your specific reasons for travel, whether you're planning to come here and work for yourself, As Chris said, you know, there's a booming kind of entrepreneur community here or whether you're coming here to kind of live off of your own income. All of those decisions and reasons as to why you're coming here are valid and they play into Mm -hmm. the whole visa and residency process. So just making sure you have all of that ironed out. And Chris, how about you? What's your experience to be able to stay in Portugal for an extended period of time? Uh, not much, really. I mean, as a European, uh, I have the benefit of um, traveling freely um, around Europe. So for me, it's not much of a difference than actually going somewhere else in the world, because the only thing I need to do, especially as a digital nomad, like moving to many different countries, is that I need to set up um, a work and um, social and insurance life that is suitable uh-huh. for um, a remote life. And so that I need to do for Portugal, but I also had to do it wherever I go, basically. So nothing, I, everything was already set up, basically. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit, Chris, in regards to saying you had to set up your social, your insurance life and things like that? What does that entail? Uh, when it comes to insurances, I mean, um, this is a gray zone, basically, because uh, when I'm always on the go and I'm never really belonging to any country, um, I basically need a travel insurance, but if right. I'm actually staying in another country and not traveling, then I need a, an insurance that covers me in that country, but still I don't want to actually write myself out of Sweden because I still want to be a Swedish citizen. 
Um, so basically you need to find either like a remote based insurance. Uh, for example, there we have companies like Safety Wing only focusing on digital nomads. But in my case, I was just using like an extended uh, home insurance um, kind of uh, add on to, to the, the insurance uh-huh. that I already have that will cover me even if I'm abroad. Uh-huh. Um, but th- I think that's different depending on what country you come from. But that was a possibility for me. And when it comes to the social life, in my case, I didn't know anyone when I came down to, to Lisbon or actually decided to go to Lisbon in, in the first place. So I needed to sort of set up um, sort of contacts already when I, when I came down. Uh, I was discovered like exploring LinkedIn, like looked out to what kind of companies can I, can I reach out to. Um, I reached out to also, um, for example, different kind of uh, clubs, like when it comes to soccer clubs and when it comes to, in my case, um, a floorball club, because I'm playing a, a sport called floorball, to see if there's, there's someone that, um, that a club that can host me and to basically integrate me into society, basically connecting me with other people. Awesome. And how about you, Jamila? Were there any things that you had to set up socially to kind of make sure you and your husband to make sure that you had some type of uh, camaraderie or friends when you came to Portugal? Definitely. Um, specifically, you know, when we went to Thailand, we did the same exercise of joining some Facebook groups. Actually, I think one of the groups that I joined is I met you, Cinnamon, Ebony Expats, mm-hmm. which is a group of expats mm-hmm. back in Thailand. And coming here, we kind of did the same exercise as far as just finding um, different communities of expats. For us, we are really into music and shows and, you know, just being outdoors. So just looking for groups of people who are into doing that kind of stuff. Um, and we also found a group here called Nomad X, which was a really great resource for just connecting with people who are here as expats that are from different countries from all over the world who want to share resources, who want to do and experience things together. So it kind of felt like a cheat code a little bit because coming here and going to those events, I would leave with like 20 or 30 new friends, you know, after just, mm-hmm. you know, one night of, you know, talking and having a few drinks. So there's so many ways to make connections before you arrive. And then when you arrive, you know, you realize there's so many other people like you who want to, you know, have a better quality of life, who want to experience new things. So um, there's so many ways to connect. And on that yeah, I really want to add, add something to that, like, because I'm really um, into the same thing. For example, like the Facebook forums is amazing. As you say, you can also find the community of Nomad X, uh, but also the platforms of Meetup and Eventbrite is, is amazing mm-hmm. to basically just meet like-minded because there's so many different like meetups around mm-hmm. Lisbon um, that had like covers different interests. So whatever you're interested in, you can definitely find a, a group of like-minded people. Um, and if you book just a couple of these meetups or events, um, the first weeks when you come down there, it's, it's perfect to mm-hmm. actually just get you straight into the social circle of Lisbon. Mm-hmm. 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 I agree. Totally. So, uh, Jamila, how do you feel like living abroad has changed your perspective on life? Um, it just has helped me to, you know, in the context of, of this move, we were coming from uh, New York City, which was kind of one of those cities where you were like working to live and living to work. And, you know, being able to define what it was that you needed to be happy was somewhat conditional on your environment. And being able to remove myself from that and seeing how much simpler and easier life can be and how, how, how happy you can be. It doesn't have to be a struggle. Like we can make choices to design our lives the way that we want to. And, you know, it is a sacrifice at times because I do miss seeing my family and friends, but overall it was the perfect opportunity for me and my partner to redesign our professional lives. I don't think if we took this leap, we would have both done that. And it's also mm-hmm. just allowed for so much personal growth. Um, so, you know, all in all, I think it's just a great way to just expand and enhance your overall life experience. Mm-hmm. How about you, Chris? How has living abroad changed your perspective on life? It really changed the fact of what a truth is for me, because there's so many things that I thought was the truth for me when I was living in Sweden, but um, just basically changing destinations and changing countries and regions for that matter, really changed the perspective of me thinking about what truth is. Um, And when I'm talking about truth, I'm talking about basically everything, what to eat, what to do and how Mm. to think. 
Um, so I, I would say that is one thing that would, it's, um, it really changed me in my way of thinking um, in general. And another thing is that it really um, gave me the insight of that there's more in life and mm -hmm. it created a hunger, ambition and drivenness of actually finding the best suitable life for me. So I would say it's like a kickstart for personal growth as um, just to, to follow up what yeah, Jamila said as well. Awesome. And so Jamila, if you could give any advice to anyone who's considering living abroad, what would that advice be? Do it. Do it now. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I would say do your research. Know what is important for you um, and, and put together, you know, a list. I think both me and Chris have talked about the things that were important to us and what we were looking for. Know what that is so you can find those destinations where you set yourself up, you know, to be in a, in a good position and, you know, come up with a plan and, and stick to it. It's going to be super scary at times. And, you know, things aren't always going to work out as planned, but I always say to people, worst case scenario, you leave and you move somewhere for a year and you've experienced something different and you go back home and now you have another chapter in your life that has opened you up to new perspectives. Um, and then saving some money just so you're financially comfortable. Um, as I alluded to earlier, one of the things we thought about with redesigning our professional lives was creating some sort of a security and base for ourselves. And part of that was financial security. So it always feels good to kind of take a leap into something new when you have a financial plan. Um, you know, the last thing I would want to be is abroad and broke. So <laughs> if you can, you know, set yourself up to be successful, it really goes a long way. And if you pick the right location, that money really stretches. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about you, Chris? How, what, what advice would you give to those individuals thinking about moving abroad? Uh, I'm going to start with the same advice. Basically, just try it and evaluate. Um, because if you don't like the destination, the worst thing is, as Jamila say, you will have another chapter, but also you will have a better list of like mm -hmm. bullets, basically, like a better checklist when you do your research in the future. So it will get you one step closer no matter what. Uh, or in best case, maybe you actually hit the bullseye straight away. Um, I would also advise people to actually educate themselves about the destination because that, that gives it better purpose. Like just educate yourself in, in cases of the, the food culture and pick up some language, uh, read, about, re read a bit about the history to understand why the city is built like it is and to understand why, why the houses look like they're looking and understand the, the culture of, of talking and understand the, the, the culture of being. Uh, listen to some music, see some videos, follow some news, listen to radio, whatever. Like just get, get yourself like a, some bits and pieces of the country to actually feel rooted. Otherwise, it's easy okay. to feel isolated if you're an expat and okay. feel like you're not part of the community. Um, and another thing is, is, as Jamila said as well, like I, I would also expect unexpected a little bit because you never know what's going to happen. And when you're um, new on, in a new place, um, it's, always, it's always hard in the beginning. So have a backup plan and also sort of put up, your, put up a strategy for yourself. Like what, is, what are you trying to achieve uh, and also how are you going to do it? Just, just give it some thought. Don't think everything just will work out because, yeah, naively, in a way, maybe it does. But also it's, it's not always the easiest part. So be, be a little bit serious about it, I would say. Awesome. Thank you. So folks, I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments uh, section below. And I want to thank my guests and my friends for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>